thank you. So I have the unenviable task of being between everyone and the distillery tour, so I will move at a brisk pace. Um, so this talk is Can Elixir Bring Down Phoenix? And it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek title. Um, everyone so far has been talking about the advantages of Elixir and Erlang and processes being a big part of them and how great they are. But processes can also be used for nefarious purposes. So if you can do 100 things at once in a good way, you can do 100 things at once in a bad way. So I'm the lead developer of Bleacher Report. We've been using uh, Elixir in production for about two and a half years. Um, there's been a lot of experimentation and growth as we've developed uh, our relationship with the language and, and Phoenix the framework. Um, it's been an overall great success. Uh, we have a few articles out about the things that we've done and the, the savings that we've had and, and uh, what we can do with that. Um, part of the adoption rate, we adopted it before Phoenix 1.0, so a lot of the let it crash was us un unintentionally breaking it and recovering. And so this sort of entuned a, a sense of refactoring. Like at, since at the time the new releases of Phoenix were coming out every couple of weeks before 1.0, we decided that we're going to refactor so often, which made it really great for us to help to ad adopt the language, to learn new things, and to uh, try out new experiments and to test things in, in production as well. Um, so one of the things that we worked on is load testing. Um, we were formerly a Rails shop. We all of our, our main app is about eight years old. It started out with Rails 1. Um, load testing with Rails is quite different than Phoenix. With Phoenix, with Rails, you see the, the, the CPUs go up in the, and add another box and so on and so forth. Um, with, when we started using Xometer, we were seeing CPU usage around 3% and we were shocked. We were, I was sure that I was doing something wrong, measuring the metrics wrong and so on. But it turns out that that's just not a, a very good way to, to measure how Elixir performs. And we've gotten a lot better. Um, we now have about 60% CPU usage, so which means that we're getting closer to how we should be doing uh, with the right amount of servers and, and using them correctly. Um, let's see. And just to give you some idea of the scale of, of Bleacher Report, which is, is pretty important when I talk about load testing, we have about 15 million app downloads, and most of those are pretty regular users. And we have about 1.5 billion page, view, page view views from, per month. And we send over 3 billion page notification, uh, push notifications a month as well. Uh, the last NFL draft, which is one of our biggest nights of the year, we sent 225 million push notifications in the first three hours. And here's a, a graph of last week's traffic. It's pretty standard. These fluctuations are normal. We have users all over, all over the world. Um, and we have a, an office in London as well. So when our day ends, their day starts, which means that We'll have influx of news and traffic, more European football-related type stories, but still there's a lot of uh, traffic in, in the uh, European side of the world and the rest of the world as well. And this is our 95th percentile latency uh, graph for our, for our app that powers the client apps, the Android, iOS, and the web client. On the left, you see the, the 95th percentile, and that's in uh, milliseconds. So it hovers around 100 milliseconds. Uh, the highest peak there is uh, just under 200 milliseconds, so it's just quite quite good. Um, at Lone Star Elixir, uh, Stephen Wintermeyer gave a talk about optimizations, and he said that sub one seconds are, as long as your response times are under one second, then it's not noticeable by the human eye. So, and sub 100 milliseconds is optimal. Apparently, over time, people notice that. Um, so we're still working on getting it under 100 milliseconds, but for the most part, I think we're pretty good with the way that we're handling our traffic. Another thing that we don't have to do anymore is before events like the, the, the NFL draft, especially the Super Bowl, uh, NFL, uh, NBA finals, and so on, we would have scale-up meetings. How many servers are we going to need because, you know, we were running Rails and we had a lot of tech debt, so the, the way that we solved the problem was by throwing more money at it. Let's, you know, we need to scale up, let's add another 20 servers or so on. And that's not a lot of fun, um, and it's not, as a developer, it's not a sense of pride when you have to scale up because your system is so clunky that the only way that you can serve the traffic is by adding more servers. So now we don't do that anymore. Um, this is, this could be the, any night basically, uh, this could be the NFL draft and so on. So it's, it's a testament to, to Elixir and Phoenix and how, uh, and how well they perform under the load that we have and the way that we need. And so we break out our old Rails app into different services and we try to do it by functionality. Um, part of the problem of having eight years of tech debt, especially in, in San Francisco, is that people, people move on, they write to-dos in the 
in the, uh, in the code and say, this is temporary, remove this later, and no one has any idea what that means in six months or a year after these people have left. And I'm sure everyone here has been f is familiar with how temporary things are in code. Um, so when we started to roll things out, basically we would sort of ask the, uh, the people who knew the, the part of the code that we were going to pull out how, the, how that would work. And you know, is this part important? Is that part important? And we try to get a reasonable guess. And the biggest, when we rolled out the biggest chunk of our new Elixir services, it turns out that a lot of these little things that people thought were, imper were, were not important were actually quite important. So we ended up rolling back, back and forth a few times until we fixed all the kinks. But, with this, but what this became obvious to us was, one, we shouldn't make the same mistake twice. I mean, if you roll out something and you didn't know it happened, fine, but doing it more than once or twice is, is unacceptable. So we started to duplex traffic uh, from our production apps to our staging apps. This, the obvious benefit is that we get to see how the, the app handles under load. We get to see if we're missing any, or getting any errors downstream, or is, it, is things, are things working as expected. And this is good for a day-to-day -day use case. And this is basically how we do it. We have this, it's, we call it ghosting traffic. So it basically, you get the, the host that you want to send the traffic to. You join that with the request path from the Phoenix con. And then you just use task start and you send the request and, and, and off it goes. So we use task start because it doesn't, it's a fire and forget. It's not blocking, it's done. And we, don't, and we, we have metrics in place that we can monitor to see how is the traffic actually going to where it should be going. Is traffic going from production to staging in the way that it should be going? And that, that's worked out really well for us. It's given us a lot of confidence that we can deploy a new service and not have to roll it back. And as, we, as each service we roll out, we find that it's getting better and better. In fact, the last service that we rolled out, we really didn't have to do any changes after it rolled out. So it's, it's really nice to be able to, to be validated by the work that you've done. But what about multiplying traffic? So especially with, like Bleacher Report is a media company. It's a sports company. Every sports, sports fans are passionate to say the least. If, if you have two sports apps, I mean, there's you know, any number of sports apps, uh, ESPN is the biggest and we're the second biggest behind them in terms of traffic, but the first by far in terms of engagement with our users through, through our social media posts, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So our users want to get the notifications first. So if they, get, if they start getting notifications faster from ESPN or some other competitor, then they're gonna go to that app. So we need to see how traffic is going to respond in these situations. Uh, I mentioned the NFL drafts. Uh, Kevin Durant, when he was traded to the Warriors last year, our traffic quadrupled in about 10 minutes, um, which is, so you can't really plan for, for these kind of things. We can't have a scale of meeting that says, Kevin Durant is gonna be traded, how do we handle this? We just have to have a system in place that handles that. And so this is, it's similar to what we did. I'll just give a, instead of writing the code, I'll just show sort of the steps. Uh, it fires off the tasks. There's, we have an environment variable for the multiplier and then it spawns that number of processes and then fires off those requests. And again, we can use the, uh, use the monitoring that we have in place to measure that those are actually being received and so on. And what, what's really interesting, one sec. What's really interesting is that we were able to, without any changes in server configuration or additional servers, we're able to have eight times the traffic of our normal day with the current configuration that we have in place. And it turns out at that point, the DB was the blocker. It, that's when it started to fall over. It was because it was, the CPU use was getting pegged at 100% and so on. Um, and this is a good problem to have. I mean, the product, product or the business people in, our, in Bleach Report would be thrilled to have eight times the amount of traffic we have. And it also gives us the sense that the system that we're building is future proof, that, it, that we can handle the fluctuations and the loads and, and so on. But this doesn't mean that we've done everything correctly. We're not resting on our laurels. We have a lot of things that we need to improve with the way that we use Elixir and Phoenix. And part of that understanding is by having developed our, our understanding of Elixir and Phoenix as they also grew, we, uh, we continue that and it's worked out really well for us. But what about volatile traffic? So with a multiplier, you can just multiply it and send it, but what if you want to do fluctuations? How does that affect your app? Can your app go from five times to three times to so on, does that work out well? So I wrote a library um, 
And as Jesse mentioned earlier, the Erlang of Zen by Freddie Bear is great. It's, it's a really nice, especially if you're just starting out with Elixir, it's a really nice overview of how of Erlang principles and, and the philosophy behind it. And, and he compares processes to bees, which, you know, they have a queen, they do some things, they come back. So I wrote this library called Locust, which is more of a chaotic type thing. Um, locusts are a swarm, they behave erratically uh, from a distance, but there's uh, there, are, there is swarm behavior, and that's sort of what this is uh, mimicking. So I, I actually wrote this um, about a year and a half ago, just started out with it, because we're using a, a third-party service to, to do these kind of things. And I was like, I wonder if, I can, if you can do that with Elixir. And it turns out you can. Um, and I, I've kind of forgot about it until about a month or two ago when I, when I decided to do this talk and thought this would be a fun talk to do. So I, I looked at the code, and I realized how my understanding of Elixir had changed quite a bit. Before I was passing around parameters from function to function, and now I use data structures to pass that around and, and do those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, so here's the locuses. This is the chaos when it attacks your server. Um, so processes themselves are very interesting. Um, as was mentioned earlier, they're lightweight, they're independent, they don't share state. Um, to give you an idea, if you do, and to give you an idea of the cost of spinning up a process, for instance, if you do io.puts, Hello, the response time ranges from like 20 to 60 microseconds. If you, do, if you spin up a process, it ranges from about 40 to 70 microseconds, so there's not much overhead to use to spin up processes. And then one of the nice things, uh, Elixir 1.4 released these calendar, uh, uh, calendar object, or calendar um, module, and which means that instead of having to do this and dealing with the Erlang tuple uh, for timestamps, you can just do this, which makes it significantly easier to deal with dates and times. Uh, and you can specify seconds, microseconds, I think nanoseconds as well. Um, so let's see how this works. Let's see how this library locust works. So some assumptions. Uh, this is, I don't have so much time. So obviously no CDN. This is just a, a vanilla app. There's only going to be reads. We could, so we'll see how many that can handle. And it's just the app. They're not using any sort of uh, background processing or anything like that. Um, and so when I was a kid, I came to Florida, went to Sanibel Island. Um, so the last time I was in Florida was 20 some years ago. And there are alligators everywhere in Sanibel Island. And it was great as a kid. I loved, the, loved animals. I loved being outdoors. And just hundreds of alligators all over the place. Um, it was fascinating to see. And so I was, you know, some of, what, a, what kind of demo app can I use to show this, this in action? So I came up with this alligator reader. So basically, it just rates alligators. Um, it's topical, I guess. Uh, it's, I mean, it's completely nonsensical, but it's totally artificial. I mean, the, you, would never use, you would never use this in production. You, you know, this is just a demo. Um, yeah, let's see. It uh, uses Ecto for persistence. Uh, no JavaScript, anything like that, no brunch. Um, and it only has one endpoint, which is git slash ratings. Um, and that just returns a list of alligators and their ratings. Um, so for reference, one request takes about 197 milliseconds. And I artificially uh, seeded the database with 1,000 records. And there's no pagination. You know, these are all just ways to simplify, and to simplify the app. And as Omid was talking about the observer earlier, this is what the observer looks like when I run the app, when I run, run the Locust app. So you can see that the schedule utilization is at 100%, and those dips are when one set of the processes finishes and the next one begins. Um, and then you can also see that the processes are taking up the majority of the memory usage uh, on the app. And so here, I was running it with 600, uh, 600 requests. So with 200 requests, it averages about 2.7 seconds. The lowest is about 28 milliseconds. And the highest is around 5.2 seconds. Uh, there are about 105 errors. And it's interesting, the errors, this is with Ecto. So a lot of the errors we're dealing with database timeouts or pool timeouts with, with connecting to the database. Uh, with 400, 400 requests, it's about the same. Uh, the average is a little bit higher. Uh, one of the sort of the drawbacks of, of this is that it doesn't pull out the error average. So this average of 3.5 seconds is also when, the, when it returns an error. So if you pull that out, it's probably, the average would be much higher. 
And an, one of the other tricky things that I came across when I was writing this was if you spin up so many processes, why was you, I'm using HTTP poison with uh, Hackney uh, as the, for the HTTP uh, calls. And I was seeing that there was always a, like a few, like a milliseconds or maybe even a second or two or three more. I couldn't figure out why that was happening. And the problem was, was the Hackney pool was, didn't have enough workers. So it would just, it, I think it has 10 workers is the default, if, if I'm correct. Um, and so it would send those 10, it would wait for those to return, send 10 again, and so on until you finish them. And so that was quite vexing because I couldn't figure out what it was doing and it was driving me crazy. Um, but it just, now I, you can use the, the uh, put env environment variable um, uh, uh, function to set the Hackney, connect, Hackney max connections and I raised that to uh, like 1,000 and it seemed to work fine. And then if you go above 400 requests, it just returns all errors. Um, so this is about what I could get using uh, Phoenix on my local machine. So how can we counteract that? What is a good way to limit, how can we get some more use out of this? So since it's only reads, um, it's fairly easy, you know, you would think that the database would be a, a, one of the larger parts of time that's spent when the, when the request is made and the response is returned. So the ETS is a good solution. Uh, ETS is Erlang Term Storage. It's, it's in memory persistence, uh, so if, if, you, uh, if your app restarts, you lose the ETS table. But it's, uh, it's, it's very handy. So some, some pros, uh, some advantages of using um, ETS are constant lookup time, so whether you have one or a thousand records in your, in your table, it's the same response time. Uh, relative database time independence in the sense that you don't have to make a call to the database, you just return the cache. Uh, it's really simple to set up and use, um, which makes it a, a, a very appealing uh, option if you need to, to heavily cache your app. Some downsides, however, uh, the syntax is clunky, so if you have, like, um, if you use a uh, if you have to do select or match on these kind of things, then that makes life a bit harder um, because of the way that the Erlang uh, search uh, functions are written. Uh, it's also on a single node. So one of this is another issue that we are sort of working on at Bleacher Report, uh, ways to get uh, better, um, is that when we first started with Elixir about two and a half years ago, there was no, there weren't really any guides for how to deploy Elixir or how to deploy Phoenix apps. So basically what we did is we just used Docker through the application and Docker and threw that up on the Elastic Beanstalk. And it works fine. Um, the deploy time is a bit slow and there's some other things to work out and then you also have the overhead of having to, to be competent with Docker. But the problem, but we have the limitation here because if you have, say, five, five server, five instances of your application deployed and you want to use ETS tables, you really can't because it's non-deterministic, depending on which server you hit, you might get a different cache response. So that's, it's a bit unfortunate that we can't do that, but now that, as I, mean, as I showed in the earlier slides, we have a stable performance uh, responsive system, now we can focus on these secondary tasks like improving uh, the, the way we deploy and using more of the distributed Elixir and Erlang um, uh, advantages. And this is also part of the fact that we understand that it's an iterative process that we can't get everything right the first time, and especially if you're just starting with Elixir and Phoenix, and I mean, I, I think almost anyone does this when they learn something new, they wanna do it all correctly and they wanna get it all done the right way. But if we'd done everything the right way, we'd still be using Rails because it's just, that's just the way it goes. You have to, it takes time to improve and to move on to things. So let's look at how to set up an ETS, how to set up ETS within your application. And it's fairly simple. Again, assuming we're using a Phoenix app, you go to web.ex and add this alligatorator.ratingscache.createETS table. Um, that does what you expect it to do. It creates the ETS table. Um, you put it, uh, this is in the start function. Um, you put it before any of the children start up in the event that you might get a call to the repo or endpoint in the milliseconds or microseconds or however many seconds there are uh, be before the app is started and the first request is made. So just put that in the top. Uh, this is the, this is the uh, create ETS table function, and it passes in a name 
uh, for the table and name table in public and set public is so that I believe other processes can access it. And if you're not familiar with the spec uh, function at the top, those are Elixir type specs. Um, I think people are mixed on whether those are useful or not. Me personally, I think they're really, really nice to have because it, and we also have the doc function as well, but I left that out of here because that's pretty self-explanatory. But the spec is nice because it gives you an uh, objective documentation of the function. You know that this function create ETS table takes no parameters and it returns a Boolean. Uh, you can also use Dialixer to validate your type specs. Um, I believe now that Dialix Dialyzer, Dialixer, which is the wrapper for Dialyzer, uh, works really well with, with Elixir before we're getting, there's still some errors, but I think they've mostly been sorted out now, so I, it's, I would recommend using it, even though it's, the error messages are kind of, kind of opaque and mysterious, but I think it's nice to have something to validate. It's a more intentional development when you say, this is what I'm doing with the, with the function, this is what I expect, and if something else is returned, it means I'm doing something wrong. So here's the lookup function. It just takes, since if this were a actual application, it would likely take some uh, parameters that would tell you which table to look up and which item in the table to retrieve. But since this is just returning every ratings in the ratings cache, then it takes no, no, uh, no functions, or no parameters. And then it returns a tuple which has the name of the table and then the contents of the table. And since, <coughs> In the event that your app crashes, if you restart, uh, there's logic in the code that says uh, the cache is empty. After this request, refill the cache and move on. And so in the event that the app crashes, you only have one, one response where you would return an empty cache. Now on the insert uh, function, this is, takes, takes, a, takes the entire list of ratings, returns a Boolean, um, and it just inserts it into the ratings table as the second option in the second uh, f field in the ratings table. And with the ETS ratings, there's about a thousand records, um, the, same as, the same as before. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no startup, uh, there's no cache when you start it up, so the first request is the same as you would expect, as there would be without a, uh, without a response, uh, without a, a cache. And it's about 60 to 90 milliseconds for the ETS table, so that's about half of what the responses with Ecto, so it, it's an immediate, uh, immediately obvious gain. And then here are the responses from the ETS table. Um, we're using ETS tables. The average response is about 3.7 seconds. The lowest is 23 milliseconds, which is quite nice. The highest is around five seconds. And you have uh, 72 errors as opposed to, I think it was like 150. So it means that the, the while there's still a number of t errors, it, at least you're seeing that the uh, error rate is much lower. Um, and the errors in this case tend to be connection closed because the, the number of available connections is, 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 uh, is, is too few. Um, and then again, with the, when you double it with 400 requests, the average is about the same, the highest is slightly higher, and the errors start going up much higher. Uh, and this is sort of what you would expect if you have some number of errors that are due to con connection unavailable, then you're gonna have significantly more if you double the request. Uh, and then if you do, and then moving any higher beyond that, it just falls off and you get all errors. Um, there's a, so there's some, some things that I would like to improve with this library. Um, one is, as I mentioned earlier, ensuring that you get more useful error, errors to say that these are this many errors of this type and so on. Uh, the average um, sh the average response shouldn't be shouldn't include the the connection the connection refused ones because that brings the average w way down. So if you see that that the um, the average is is 3.7 seconds, that doesn't include any of the ones that were timed out. Um, and then one of the another thing that I would like to do is. Um, add some time-based attacks. Like one of the, when we were using this third-party service, one of the things you could do is over a certain amount of time send this many connections. And the way that I have it is that you can just send uh, so many connects, so you send a maximum number of requests and you divide that by uh, intervals and that's how it sends them. Um, and then the way that I've been testing this is using a library called Bypass. 
Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, bypass basically allows you to simulate uh, integration tests. So in this case, this would be incredibly helpful to to use that to so you don't have to make the calls out. You can just make a make a, a fake request to some simulator response and you get all that you need back from it. And you can uh, change like the the what the um, what the requests and response are within bypass, which is really helpful. So I would recommend using that. Um, and I can show you a quick demo of how this works. Um, let's see. So let's see. So I'll show you first. Oops. Show you first the. So develop is with Ecto as the, uh, oh, okay, hold on. So let's send a thousand and oh, you can also with the with locust you can uh, do simulate post requests as well so it's it's uh, getting there in terms of features um, so basically what this does is you can send a thousand uh, requests and increment them by 200 so it's in 200 400 600 800 and so on and then you start that and then you can immediately see it go over here and you can also see probably not very easily but the the response times are increasing as the number of processes. And then here you start to see that the timeouts happen. And then try to, oh, try to bring up the observer as well. Oh, there you go. Let's see. Yeah, let's see, I'll try again. So, yeah, so you can immediately see that the scheduler goes to 100% and watches the memory climbs. Um, you know, as Omid was saying, this is a really, really incredibly useful tool so you to see what's going on in your application. Um, you can see the memory allocation and, and so on as well. And then if we just stop that. Now we can, so, uh, and then we can check out the ETS branch. And then if we just do one request, just to get the, here you can see that it's read by the, by Ecto. And then if we try it again, you can see that there's no request, there's no uh, query in Ecto. So let's try it, let's do 500 and increment by 100. And then, and you can still see that it's, the, the times are significantly better, but they're still well beyond the range of acceptable times, considering that response time should be sub one second, and all of these are five, six, seven seconds, and so on. And it's going to go a bit more. Then, yeah, okay, so that's basically that, and then eventually it'll start timing out because of the, the uh, connection error. All right, so I kind of went through this a little bit quickly because we're, I guess, a little bit behind, um, but yes, user processes responsibly, responsibly and uh, thanks for listening. Wow. <laughs>